If you're thinking about a hair transplant, maybe you're browsing clinics late at night, looking for top ranked surgeons, checking out their photo galleries, but maybe you're also wondering, do transplanted hairs last forever? Well, nearly all of the top ranking Google articles say yes. They use language like permanent, long lasting, the only permanent solution to hair loss. And as you might guess, these articles are mostly written by transplant clinics. No surprises there. But what is surprising is that that's actually not true. Contrary to popular belief, transplants do thin, and this video is going to explain why. We'll dive into the science, the studies, and how a phenomenon known as recipient site influence might be the key to initiating breakthrough hair growth treatments. That's all coming up. This is Rob from Perfect Hair Health, and today we are going to be diving into the science behind hair transplants. Do they last forever? Well, the answer is not what most people think, and new evidence is actually making people ask, are these procedures even worth it? Stick around until the end because we're going to answer that exact question. So back to hair transplants. Hair transplants are surgical treatments for androgenic alopecia, also known as male and female pattern hair loss. This is a hair loss disorder driven by genetics, driven by hormones, and other factors. And typically without treatment, it often worsens until things look like this or this. That's a slick bald scalp for most men with some hair retained around the scalp perimeter. Now, a transplant is when a surgeon takes hairs from this area and then places them here. The idea is to basically add in hair where things look a bit thinner. And in the early days, transplants were a total disaster. They looked very obvious and very obtrusive. Today, surgeons have made incredible progress reshaping hairlines, improving density, filling in these bald spots, basically to the point where many transplants nowadays, they're basically cosmetically imperceptible, at least to most people. So it's no wonder why the hair transplant industry, it's exploded in China, in North America, in Europe. I mean, it's now commonplace for somebody to travel to Turkey, get a low-cost transplant, and then be seen bandaged up in the airport boarding their flight home the next day. And a lot of these clinics, well, they come with the terms guaranteed permanent results. But again, do transplanted hairs last forever? Well, nothing lasts forever, so let's rephrase the question. Do transplanted hairs last a lifetime? Google's top articles say yes. Clinics that sell us hair transplants say yes. But 70 years ago, the answer was actually, we don't know. Because at that time, transplants on humans, they hadn't really been conducted, at least until 1959, when a doctor named Norman Orentreich published the first ever transplant study on men with androgenic alopecia. And he more or less revolutionized the way we've treated pattern hair loss ever since. Using over 50 subjects, Orentreich took punch graphs from the backs of men's scalps, where hair is generally protected from baldness. Then he moved those graphs to the hairlines, where men were receding. He also did the opposite. He took punch graphs from bald regions and then moved those bald regions to the back of the scalp. His goal, to find out how these transplanted hairs behaved over time. And so he got busy waiting. Two and a half years later, Orentreich discovered something fascinating. The healthy hairs he took from here and then moved to the hairline, they continued to grow just fine, despite those men's hairlines continuing to recede. Oren Trike described this phenomenon as donor dominance, meaning that the transplanted hairs retained their original characteristics despite being placed in a new scalp environment. In fact, he found the same to be true for bald skin that was moved to the back of the scalp. That skin remained bald even though the skin was now in an area supposedly protected from baldness. His conclusion that scalp hairs are donor dominant, that our scalp environments do not influence baldness, that pattern hair loss is probably a process that is genetically determined within each hair follicle itself, and that all baldness theories related to things like scalp tension or low oxygen levels or skull expansion, these ideas were probably wrong. Because if they were right, those transplanted hairs, well, they should have begun to behave differently when they were moved to new environments. Thus, the hair transplant industry was born, and over the next two decades, other researchers began to confirm Dr. Oren Trike's findings. They bolstered the theory of donor dominance, and they shifted the focus of androgenic alopecia research away from a scalp environment and more toward the individual follicles themselves. If you fast forward to today, we have some pretty incredible treatments to stop the progression of this condition. And hair transplants, well, they've become a staple procedure 
procedure to cosmetically restore much of what people have already lost. But even after Orntreich's landmark study, there were still questions remaining about the theory of donor dominance. Questions like, is two and a half years really enough time to tell if transplanted hairs last forever? Well, the short answer is no, and here is why. Our hair cycle typically lasts anywhere from two to seven years. That's the process where hairs grow, then they rest, then they shed, the old follicle degenerates, and then a new follicle regenerates to take the old one's place. And then that hair grows and then the process repeats for the duration of our lives. With this in mind, the defining characteristic of pattern hair loss, the way that this hair loss disorder actually progresses, is hair follicle miniaturization. That's when each hair strand gets progressively thinner and thinner and thinner over time. And this process of miniaturization, it actually only occurs through hair shedding. More specifically, miniaturization happens between the hair cycles. Right after a hair sheds, the old follicle collapses, a new follicle comes in to take its place, but in pattern hair loss, when that new follicle comes in, it's smaller than the last hair cycle. And so it produces a thinner hair strand, and then that hair grows until it eventually sheds, and the process of miniaturization repeats. And then it repeats, and then it repeats, until eventually you're dealing with a slick, bald scalp. So to put it bluntly, no shedding, no miniaturization. No hair cycling, no miniaturization. Now, back to Orentreich's original study. Its duration was just two and a half years. That's the low end of a single hair cycle. Is that really enough time to evaluate if transplanted hairs grow forever? Obviously not. We need to observe multiple hair cycles. That way, we can see if miniaturization between each cycle begins to occur. That's going to take a longer time horizon, five years, 10 years, 15 years, because after all, our hair cycles last two to seven years. And while it's true that hair cycles can accelerate in androgenic alopecia, and they often do, the affected hair and the process, it still takes decades to reach a slick bald scalp. The good news is that Orentreich's study was done over 60 years ago, and since then millions of people have received a hair transplant. On top of that, hundreds of studies have been published detailing patient results, technique comparisons, we've got FUE, FUT, robotics procedures, you name it. So with all these data points and all these years, researchers have surely published dozens of studies showing the long-term viability of human hair transplants. You know, follow-up studies tracking patients over 5, 10, 15 years, right? Wrong. In fact, completely wrong. My team and I conducted a systematic search through PubMed. We spent dozens of hours pouring through the studies available. I even personally reached out to the International Society of Hair Restoration Surgery to see if we were missing anything. We found two papers. First, a 1970 opinion piece by Oren Trike himself, who stated, as an opinion without any supporting data that over the last 15 years, there has been no instance of donor hair bearing grafts failing to continue the hair growth initially accomplished if the donor site is still in an area of the scalp that is growing hair. That sounds amazing. And even without objective data, let's take him at his word. The second paper gave slightly different results. It was a 1972 survey study done on men who got a hair transplant between 1965 to 1970. Contrary to Orentreich's opinion piece, this patient survey suggested that only 60% of patients reported no loss of hair in their transplanted sites. So beyond Orentreich's opinion article and a five-year patient satisfaction survey, do we have any robust long-term studies on hair transplant patients five, 10, 15 years post-operation? According to our literature search, the answer is no even with 60 plus years of data. In fact, when we search the literature on hair transplants for terms like survival and long-term, nearly all studies fitting this criteria in the last two decades, well, they define the terms long-term as just a two-year follow-up period. That's less than two hair cycles. In the last 20 years, the longest follow-up study that we could find was just four years. And the results were a bit shocking and we're gonna to get to that in just a minute. So this begs the question, since Orentreich's 1959 publication, what have we actually learned about hair transplants? Well, specifically, what have we learned about the behavior of donor hairs? 
Apparently a lot and not all of our new findings fit perfectly with the theory of 100% donor dominance. Here are three examples. In 2002, researchers found over a three year window that hairs taken from the backs of our scalps and then moved to our legs had notably lower survival rates, about 60% compared to the reported 90 plus percent survival rates from most hair transplant surgeons from the occipital to the front of the scalp. And those transplanted scalp legs turned hair legs? They grew significantly slower than scalp hairs. Instead, they actually converged toward the growth rates of leg hairs. The researchers hypothesized that these hairs might be influenced by, I quote, recipient site characteristics such as vascularity, dermal thickness, or skin tension. In other words, the environment where these hairs were transplanted seemed to change their behaviors. Then in 2009, a research team transplanted chest hairs into the scalps of men with angiogenic alopecia. They found that those chest hairs turned scalp hairs now grew longer and faster than other chest hairs. And just like that 2002 study, these hairs converged toward the growth characteristics of their new environment. And that's why that group concluded that the behavior of donor hairs is, in part, influenced by the environment where they're transplanted. This is a phenomenon known as recipient site influence. And when it comes to transplant research, these findings are actually just the tip of the iceberg. In 2002, the Orentrike Foundation, and yes, that is the same Orentrike from 1959, conducted a study that took balding human scalp hairs and then transplanted those hairs onto the backs of immunodeficient mice. After several months, what happened? Well, those balding human hairs turned mouse hairs, they completely regenerated, and within a single hair cycle. Even crazier, those balding human hairs continued thickening throughout the duration of the study. Whereas the human scalp hairs that were transplanted to the mice but weren't initially balding, these healthy hairs, for unknown reasons, they just stopped thickening after 17 weeks. It was almost as if, in balding scalps, the hairs that were miniaturizing were primed to grow bigger but some signaling in their follicular environment prevented it from happening. And yet once that environment changed, the follicles regenerated and thickened stronger and better than their healthy hair counterparts. So what could explain these results? The investigators, they didn't know. They hypothesized that the regeneration might be due to lower androgen levels in mice. Similar to how the drug finasteride lowers the hormone DHT and in doing so, increases hair thickness in men. But puzzlingly, those balding transplanted human hairs, they regrew just as well on male and on female mice. In other words, in high and low androgen environments, something which the researchers couldn't really explain. Moreover, the regrowth from the transplants, it happened much faster than the regrowth we typically see from androgen deprivation in humans, where the hairs do get thicker, but it doesn't happen in a single hair cycle. It happens over several hair cycles. So if scalp hairs are 100% dominant, as suggested by Orentrike, why do scalp hairs, when transplanted to the leg, have lower survivability and slower growth rates? Why do chest hairs, when transplanted to the scalp, start growing faster and start growing longer? And why do balding hair follicles, when transplanted to the backs of mice, regenerate in a single hair cycle and continue growing thicker than their non-balding hair counterparts? At a minimum, these findings, they introduce some nuance to the theory of donor dominance. Recipient site influence, it does appear to have an effect on the behavior of scalp hairs. And when we couple these three papers with two other things, first, the unusual absence of studies on long-term outcomes for human hair transplants, and second, the financial incentives for surgeons to only publish favorable transplant data, which, by the way, research groups have written openly about, you find yourself in a landscape of transplant research that is actually a lot harder to interpret than what these top-ranking Google articles claim. Even still, the question remains, do these transplanted hairs actually thin over time? Well, according to recent literature reviews on hair transplants, the answer is yes. Nowadays, many surgeons actually admit that transplanted hairs can thin. However, they rationalize this thinning phenomenon with explanations that happen to still hold on to the ideas of 100% donor dominance. First, they say that hairs might thin because of a bad hair transplant. Specifically, if a surgeon takes donor hairs that are too close to balding regions where the balding clock will soon begin. In my eyes, this is actually completely reasonable. Second, 
They say that in advanced stages of androgenic alopecia, or in cases of diffused unpatterned hair loss, or DUPA, even these donor safe zones, well, they'll start to thin over time. So if you do have a transplant, but you have advanced hair loss, or DUPA, and you start to thin, this might be why. Again, that's a completely reasonable answer. And lastly, some surgeons argue that transplanted hairs, well, they actually don't thin. Instead, it's just the hair surrounding the transplant that thins, giving the impression of losing transplanted hairs when in reality, we're just seeing the advancement of pattern hair loss. And again, I also think this is a completely fair point. So the question then becomes, what sort of study do we need to design to rule out these possible explanations for why transplants might appear to thin? First, we'd need a study that did transplants on patients deep into the donor safe regions, like an FUT procedure. It's where you take a strip of hair from here and transplant it into balding regions. Then we need to show that these transplanted hairs thin more rapidly than the hairs above and below that strip procedure, because that would take the whole destined to thin argument off the table. Next, we'd need to know that these patients actually received a successful hair transplant. In other words, at the one year mark, we'd need to see that these transplanted hairs grew in just fine because that would eliminate the possibility of receiving a bad transplant that leads to bad results. And finally, we need to make sure that those transplanted hairs were actually placed in areas where we could easily track their survival. So that's more achievable in people with advanced stages of hair loss where healthy hairs are transplanted into mostly barren areas of the scalp. That would remove a lot of the ambiguity over the perception of thinning since the hair in those recipient sites, well, that hair would have already mostly disappeared. Now, that is a lot to ask for. That is a very specific study design. And given the mysterious absence of data on long-term hair transplant survivability in humans, I was shocked to discover that this study, it actually exists. It came out at the end of 2020. It included 112 men, all of whom had advanced degrees of hair loss and all of whom received FUT procedures deep into the donor safe zone. In other words, their hairs were taken far in the donor safe region areas and they were placed in areas of significant balding. This makes tracking a lot easier. At the one year follow up, over 80% of these men, they demonstrated good regrowth of the transplanted hair or better. In other words, these men didn't receive bad hair transplants. They grew in just fine during their first hair cycle. So what happened to these hairs three years later at the four year follow-up? Four years post-surgery, the investigators took new photos of the men, brought in an independent researcher and had them assess the hair quality changes. They uncovered the following results. Slight thinning of transplanted hairs in 28% of patients, moderate thinning in 55%, and significant thinning in 8%. In fact, of the 112 men in this study, only 10 of them showed no loss of transplanted hair density four years after their surgery. Think about that. Over 90% of the men at the four year mark saw a reduction in hair volume of their transplanted hairs. Again, these are men who had advanced stages of hair loss. They received FUT procedures deep into donor safe regions, and they also had hairs transplanted into areas that were significantly barren. They'd already thinned, making tracking of the hairs much easier. In fact, here's some global photographs from the study. Pre-transplant, one year, and then here's the four year mark. It's a big density drop. Again, pre-transplant, the one year mark, and here is the four year mark. And while we don't have hair count assessments accompanying the study, when we look at that donor region in these photos where those hairs were originally taken, the hair growing above and below the strip procedure, it appears to be growing just fine, long enough to even cover the actual strip scar itself. For these reasons, it is no surprise that the investigators concluded the hair grafts transplanted may not last permanently for all subjects. Recipient site influence might affect the growth and long-term survival of the transplanted hairs. Again, this study, it's the longest follow-up study that we have on human hair transplants, as in not an opinion piece, not a patient survey that I've ever seen. It's just four years. And at that four year mark, over 90% of patients, according to these investigators, they were experiencing thinning of the transplanted hairs. Knowing this, Let's go back and reevaluate that first page of search results on Google. Do transplanted hairs last forever? 
because not everybody on this page says yes. In fact, when you talk to university dermatologists or researchers like Dr. Donovan, one of the world's top hair loss specialists, they talk right on their pages that hair transplants do not last forever, that that is a myth. And Dr. Donovan doesn't only mention answers that still fall in line with 100% donor dominance. Instead, he directly postulates about the immunological and physiological factors that influence donor hairs and acknowledges the absence of data despite 60 plus years of surgical practice. And then there's this interview between Dr. Nilofar Farjo and Dr. Maxim Plikas. Dr. Farjo is the secretary of the International Society of Hair Restoration Surgery. She's also a respected transplant surgeon. Dr. Plikas is a university professor whose research interests involve the WNT pathway and new treatments for hair growth. In other words, these are incredibly accomplished doctors with incredible expertise in the area that we are talking about. So let's hear what they actually say on the subject. So moving occipital hairs to the frontal scalp so, for instance, we do see that over time, um, those hair follicles that have been moved do change. So, we often get patients 20 years later who come back and they say, oh, well, their, their hair follicles that were very robust and their hair transplant that looked very thick at the time that it was done it has now started to thin and doesn't look the same anymore. So, do you think it, there is that uh, happening as well with these hair follicles? And I think, you know, what, what you're saying is a really great insight. I think um, the dogma in hair transplantation was that occipital hair remained testosterone insensitive, even if they are grafted into otherwise testosterone sensitive recipient area. And I think from my reading of hair transplantation literature, for the most part that remains true that the epithelial and dermal papilla cells in the grafted follicles retain the original biology. But as you said, and as I said, hairs are also acquiring local signals from the surrounding cells. And perhaps in the beginning, after transplantation, most of the signals are acquired from the adipose cells that were carried over with the graft. But as years and decades pass, the host tissue becomes more integrated with these hairs. And it's very possible that the host adipose tissue in the frontal skull is also testosterone sensitive and secretes what we can define as negative factors. So over time, you might start seeing those additional kind of inhibitory effects from outside of the hair in the host tissue now affecting the grafted hair. So this is quite possible. Right. Well, that, that's really a very fascinating point because it is something that in our discussion groups that we've discussed and amongst ourselves, you know, are, are other people seeing it and everybody does see it. So that's a really actually a fascinating insight. There you go. Recipient sites do affect hair transplant outcomes. Transplants can miniaturize given enough time. And while surgeons initially rationalized this thinning through explanations that clung on to the idea of 100% donor dominance, we're now realizing that that probably just isn't true. Again, Oren Trike's original study lasted just two and a half years, less than two hair cycles most likely. Miniaturization happens through hair cycling. Hair cycles last two to seven years. So if we are to truly test the theory of donor dominance, we cannot do it in a two year study. We have to wait longer. And according to this study, this interview, the opinions of top tiered hair loss specialists, and the studies that we showed earlier, it's clear that these recipient sites, they play a much larger role in hair transplant survivability than initially suspected. And that is why papers published in Nature now admit contrary to popular belief, that hair transplants do not last forever. So why does Oren Trike's 1970 opinion article say, over a 15 year period of observation, hair transplants don't thin, yet this 2020 study says in just four years, yes they do. Well, if you are a conspiracy theorist, you might allege that Oren Trike lied, that he offered an opinion unsubstantiated by any objective data to protect his financial interests in hair transplant surgeries. I have heard this argument before and I 100% disagree with it. First, I think it's a terrible habit to assume the worst in people. So let's acknowledge the obvious. 
Yes, there are discrepancies in survivability claims between Oren Trike's 1970 opinion article and that 1972 patient survey. Yes, there are startling differences in survivability claims between the 1970 papers and that 2020 paper. But I don't think Orentrike lied at all. I think he reported what he honestly saw, as most research groups do. My take is actually that all of these results, the 1970 article, the 1972 patient survey, and this 2020 study, they're all valid. And these discrepancies, they might not be due to data obfuscation, rather they're probably due to methodological differences between the transplants of today versus the transplants of the 1960s. The old transplants, those typically used 3.5 to 4 millimeter punch biopsies containing dozens and dozens of hair follicles per punch. Modern day transplants, they are done with grafts as small as 0.8 millimeters, often containing just a single strand or unit of hair follicles. Knowing this, we can start to ask better questions. Questions like, does the amount of tissue that we carry surrounding a hair transplant influence its survivability? And the answer appears to be yes. In this study, researchers compared survivability rates between transplanting individual hair follicle units versus the full hair follicle clusters themselves. After six months, survival rates for the individual follicles, they were 25% lower than the clusters. Similarly, these studies showed that the more fat left surrounding a transplanted hair follicle, the better the survival rates of those transplanted follicles. One way to interpret this, the volume of tissue we leave surrounding hair transplants might act like a buffer against recipient site influence of donor hairs. Maybe the more tissue left, the better the survival rate, the better the retention of donor dominance. But the less tissue left, the worse the survival rate. And here's where things get even more interesting. In 2015, a team of researchers, including Max Plikus, wanted to find out if hair follicles could cross communicate with one another for regeneration using varying degrees and distances of wounding. So they set up a study on mice where they plucked 200 hairs from the backs of mice, all while controlling for the diameter of their plucking region. In some cases, 200 hairs were plucked in a 2.4 millimeter region. In other cases, 200 hairs were plucked from an 8 millimeter region. The smaller the region, the higher density the plucking, and vice versa. What were the findings? With low density plucking, hair follicles either didn't grow back at all, or they regrew back to their normal pre-plucking density. It's basically what we would expect to happen. But with higher density plucking, the researchers found that the mice created new hair follicles. And not just a few new hair follicles, we're talking about a 500% increase in the volume of hair follicles. The researchers suggested that this higher density plucking created more inflammatory signaling, which led to more cross communication between nearby follicles, which signaled those hair follicles to regenerate, regardless of whether they had been plucked. The end result, a big increase in hair counts. Now, I know we're talking about a mouse study here, but this type of hair follicle coordination, it probably applies to humans too. After all, we've seen injuries to the parietal side of scalps in bald men evoke hair regrowth across entire slick bald regions. This is fascinating for dozens of reasons, but the relevant one to this discussion is that hair follicles can talk to each other across distances of 2.4 millimeters to 6 millimeters, and probably even greater. Knowing this, let's reflect back to Orentrike's original paper. How big were those punch grafts that he transplanted from the backs of the scalps to the front? They were 6 to 12 millimeters. I mean, look at this photo. For starters, it shows just how barbaric these original transplants were, but importantly, it also shows the significance of the amount of skin taken because a 6 to 12 millimeter punch biopsy contains literally dozens of hair follicle clusters. And because of this, we have to be careful about the conclusions we draw from transplant studies using 6 to 12 millimeter punch biopsy grafts that contain dozens of hair follicles when we've now learned that hair follicles can communicate across considerable distances. There's just too much surrounding tissue of influence. And based on these findings, it's no wonder why Orentrike's original transplants, they probably didn't thin. At the time that he was conducting his long-term study observations, 
everyone was transplanting literal plugs of hair, three to four millimeter punch biopsies, sometimes even larger, containing dozens and dozens of hair follicles. In my opinion, that degree of excess tissue and that number of hair follicles, well, it probably creates quite a buffer against recipient site influence. Likewise, this would also apply in the opposite direction like case reports of balding hairs that were transplanted to the forearm with four millimeter punch biopsies. Those should also continue to thin, especially when we consider that the transplant itself will first initiate an immediate shed, which then triggers hair cycling, which then triggers miniaturization, and that that four millimeter of tissue is more than enough surrounding zone to keep those hair follicles talking to each other and exhibiting the same behaviors. All right. Enough of the scientific analysis and my read of the transplant data. I'd like to repose the big question at hand. If these studies are correct and if transplants do not last forever, then is a hair transplant a complete waste of money? And the answer, of course, is no. The truth is that most transplants will last a long time many years and certainly long enough to warrant the procedure for most people. And if you get a transplant, you can do a lot of things to prolong the survivability of those hairs. For example, using treatments like finasteride. So with the right surgeon, the right plan, the right hair loss type, your transplant will probably be worth it and it will probably last a very, very long time. Again, the purpose of this video is not to scare anybody away from getting a hair transplant. It's just to illustrate that recipient sites do influence the fate of transplanted hairs. And that's a science scientific thing that people don't really talk about very often. In that line, I see major opportunities to leverage research on recipient site influence to encourage the proliferation of new hair follicles and maybe even develop new hair loss treatments. For example, scalp hairs transplanted into ulcers on the legs of type 1 diabetic patients. Those scalp hairs, they grow skin and that skin can actually heal the ulcer. This begs the question, what sort of wounding environment do we need to create to get a transplanted hair? to regenerate its surrounding miniaturized hair follicles. Because we already know under the right wounding conditions that scalps have gone from completely bald to a full head of hair all by accident. We're actually starting to put together a project about this right now. And depending on how far it goes, we might talk about it in a later video. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this analysis on hair transplant survivability. In the next video, we are going to talk about microneedling. My team and I just published a big literature review on this topic. I am thrilled to share the results with you. Thank you for watching and take care.